Good afternoon and welcome to MOS Live. My name is Becca, my pronouns are she and her, and today I will be your moderator, which means I will be sharing all of your questions and comments with our educators. Today you are here for our live animal presentation and we're going to be seeing a few different animals, so hopefully you're excited for that. If you're joining us on Zoom and you have any questions or comments during the presentation, you can feel free to type them into our Q&A box and I'll get to as many as we possibly can. If uh, you're joining us on Facebook and on YouTube, thank you very much for being here. Unfortunately, we cannot see any of your comments during our live broadcast. And if you're joining us on Zoom and would like captions, you can click on the close caption link at the bottom of your screen and click show subtitles. So with that, I'm going to ask my educator to introduce themselves and we'll get started with our first animal. Hi everyone, I'm Liz, assistant curator from our live animal center here at the museum. Helping me out today is Corey, our invertebrate keeper. Now, we wanted to introduce you guys to animals that you could find in your backyard. Might seem like kind of a weird theme at first, but there's lots of animals you can find in your yard, in your neighborhood, in a park near you. Uh, just to give a couple examples, uh, some reptiles. Maybe you guys have been lucky enough to find snakes in your backyard. Here in New England, we have about 13 different kinds of snakes. So that's one kind of animal you can find. Also amphibians. Maybe if you live near some water, you've seen some frogs and toads that are native to this area. There's lots of different animals you can find. The first animal I wanted to introduce to you today is a mammal. So it's one of the mammals that you can find in your own backyard. Now I'm gonna have Corey introduce her. One you guys will recognize right away. Pretty common mammal. Now this is an animal called a rabbit. Now more specifically, this rabbit is a domestic rabbit. So this is not exactly the same as rabbits you would find in your backyard, but she is a pretty good example of a rabbit. Now I say that word domestic. Being domesticated is actually a very special process. It is selective breeding that is done by people over many generations. So it takes thousands and thousands of years to truly domesticate an animal. So what that means is this domestic rabbit is different than rabbits that are out in the wild. To give you other good examples of domestic animals, cats and dogs are domesticated animals. Now, the specific breed of this domestic rabbit is called a mini lop. Now, that's a little bit about domestication. Now, wild rabbits that we have here in New England, there's actually two different kinds of cottontails. There's Eastern cottontails and New England cottontails. Uh, now, Eastern were actually introduced years and years ago, and now they're more uh, populous than even those New England cottontails that were originally here. Now rabbits are pretty successful out in the wild. Um, they're pretty good at reproducing. Rabbits can have two to three litters a year and could have up to eight babies at once. So they are pretty good at uh, getting their numbers up high. Um, they're also generalists in terms of what they eat. So they eat, will eat lots of different vegetation at different times of year. Years, they'll eat uh, leaves, stems, uh, they'll even eat wood parts of uh, trees, so they'll eat bark and things like that that maybe other animals aren't as willing to eat. They'll eat fruits and vegetables that they find, uh, stems, flowers, um, so they're really not too picky and will eat lots of different things. Now, one last kind of fun fact that I always like to share about our uh, rabbit or rabbits in general is actually a group of animals they belong to. A lot of times people think rabbits are rodents. So they think they're related to things like rats, mice, squirrels, chipmunks, and they're actually not. Rabbits belong to their own group that is called lagomorphs. So rabbits are related to only two other kinds of animals, hares, which you've probably heard of, and another animal called a pika. Now rodents and lagomorphs are pretty similar. So they have similar kinds of teeth. So with rodents, they have chisel-like incisors. So they're your front 
teeth, two on the top, two on the bottom. And they actually, those teeth will grow throughout the entire lifetime of that animal, kind of like our hair and our fingernails. So that's a rodent characteristic, having those chisel-like incisors. Now, lagomorphs, like our rabbit here, also have those incisors that grow throughout their lifetime, but rather than having two on the top and two on the bottom, lagomorphs actually have an extra set of incisors. So they have those two top incisors and then right behind, they have another set of incisors. Uh, pretty cool. So scientists years ago actually did classify them as rodents, but then when they kind of made that discovery, they decided it was uh, different enough that they are in fact in their own group of animals. So that is lagomorph. Now I see we have a couple questions. So why don't I turn it over to some of those? Sure, we do have some questions coming in. And of course we have one of the very typical questions. What is this rabbit's name? This rabbit's name is Pancake uh, and she is about two years old now. Um, so she is mature. She's definitely considered an adult at two years old. Uh, rabbits typically live about eight years. They are known to live up to 12 years living with people. Um, so she hopefully has a nice long life ahead of her. Awesome. And he just answered Prisha's question too about how old can they be? So Elliot, age six, is wondering why its nose is so wiggly. <laughs> so rabbits have a really good sense of smell. So that was a great observation. So she's just sniffing things out right now, uh, just kind of checking out her surroundings. Actually, the space that we have her in right now for our show, she has never been in before. Um, so that sense of smell is really uh, just kind of how she's checking things out. Um, but yes, it does seem like a very active nose. I would definitely agree with that uh, observation. Also pretty adorable. <laughs> um, so how much does this rabbit weigh? She, that's a good question. I actually don't know the last time I weighed her, but rabbits are usually no more than a couple pounds at the really big ones. Um, so she's probably, probably about three or four pounds, uh, I would say. Um, so definitely smaller than your average house cat. Um, and that she is a full grown um, adult female, so she won't get much bigger than this. Nick, age 17, is wondering, what does it mean if the rabbit's ears are down or is it born that way? That's a great question. Um, so this breed of rabbit is called a mini lop and that lop has to do with the ear placement. So it's those ears kind of hanging down. That is a lop rabbit. Um, so she was born this way. Um, typically the ones that you'll see in the wild, like those cottontails I was talking about, have their ears kind of more where you think of them for a rabbit sticking straight up. Um, I personally think the, the mini lops are pretty adorable with the ears hanging down, um, but you probably wouldn't really see that in the wild. Awesome. And it looks like we probably have time for just maybe one more question before we switch to our next animal. So uh, we noticed she was eating a little bit of lettuce there. What does she normally eat? So rabbits in the wild, like I said, are generalists, will eat lots of different plants that they can find. Uh, domesticated rabbits that live with people, um, you actually can find a commercial rabbit pellet, which is kind of a dry based food that's more or less crushed vegetation. That's one of the main things they eat. And then she does get some greens as part of her diet. So what you saw her eating was a little bit of um, romaine lettuce, a little bit of kale, and then some dandelion greens. Uh, occasionally she'll get things like carrot, um, but it is better for her to just eat those greens, the pellets, and then actually hay. Timothy hay is a big part of rabbit's diet. Uh, so it is important that they eat lots of hay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Liz. Now I'm going to share my screen so we can get a little bit more information on our rabbit that we just saw before we move on to our next animal. So if you had any questions that didn't get answered or you just wanted to learn a little bit more about our rabbit, you can take a picture of this screen here so that you just learn a few more facts about our rabbit, Pancake. And we're gonna wait just we, a few more seconds until we're ready for our next animal. I think we're just about ready now. So All this right. next animal, is going to be a bird and it might be hard to see 
in the wild, you may have actually heard one of these more than seen them. Um, but they are often birds that you can find in your own backyard. Now you guys are probably able to guess uh, at least what kind of bird this is. So it is definitely an owl. More specifically, this is an Eastern screech owl. Now, Eastern screech owls are the second smallest owl that you can find in the New England area. Believe it or not, there is one a little bit smaller than this called the saw wet owl. So while these screech owls are native to New England and could potentially live in your own backyard, they are pretty challenging to see in the wild. Um, there's probably a couple different reasons why they're tough to see. One is just their activity level. Owls tend to be nocturnal or active mostly at nighttime. Now our screech owl is a little more on our schedule here at the museum. So she's up when we are up, um, but in the wild, they definitely would be active when we are a little more inactive. Another reason they're tough to see is that size. They're pretty small. This is a full grown adult. Uh, so they're pretty tiny animals. Um, they also have really good camouflage. Now you're probably not having too much trouble seeing our screech owl right now, but if you could picture her in the cavity or hole of a tree, she'd blend in really, really well. She would practically disappear. So they definitely can be challenging to see. Uh, however, like I said at the beginning, maybe you've heard an Eastern screech owl and you didn't even realize this was the animal you are, were listening to. Now, screech owls do not truly screech. I'm not really sure why they got that name. The sound they make is very low. It almost sounds like a horse whinny. It's referred to as a trill. Uh, I'm not gonna imitate it because I'm not very good at my bird noises. And I don't think our screech owl will do it on command uh, at the show right now, um, but it is that trill sound that they make. Now, if you think, you know what, I have some trees in my yard. I bet I do have owls living in my backyard. You actually can do something to potentially try to spot one of these owls. Now, this is a technique that is called calling in an owl. Now, in order to call in an owl, you have to be willing to do a few things. Uh, one, you have to go outside very late at night, the middle of the night, so let's say 1, 2 a.m., um, the best time to do this is actually the mating season when owls are going to be looking for one another. So you can start as early as January, February. That's when the earliest owl in this area will mate. That is a great horned owl. So you're gonna go outside really late, probably pretty cold because it's gonna be winter. And then you're gonna do your best imitation of an owl call. Now those great horned owls that I just mentioned, they're actually the easiest ones to imitate they make the characteristic hoot. When you think owl in your head, it's a great horned owl that you're thinking of. So they're probably gonna be the easiest ones. So you just go out and hoot. Uh, if you're lucky and there's an owl in your area, it may call back. Eventually it may come investigate and see if you are a potential mate or something that this uh, owl wants to avoid. So that is a legitimate technique you can do. It's called calling in an owl. Now to call in a screech owl, their sound is a little more challenging to make, uh, but I, I don't know, I might challenge you guys to try to call in a screech owl. Um, you probably should do it a couple months after, uh, so more like March uh, would be more when their breeding season starts. Um, but that is definitely something you can try if you think you might have owls in your yard. Uh, now I see we have another uh, couple of questions, so why don't I turn it over to that? We do. So we have some of the typical questions um, from a few different people. So one of them is Vivian, age nine, wondering what is her name and age? This screech owl is named Cree and uh, she is about eight years old now. Um, so she is mature and considered an adult, much like our rabbit was considered an adult at uh, her two years of age. Screech owls living with people are known to live a long time. They can live 15, even 20 years uh, would be a pretty good lifespan for a screech owl. Awesome. And uh, we have a few questions. Someone's asking, does this animal have a favorite food? Someone else, uh, Chad, age 15, is asking, what do they eat? 
So I think you guys may have gotten a glimpse of our screech owl eating a treat that Corey gave her. Um, what she was eating uh, a few moments ago was actually a cricket. Um, so they actually eat a lot of insects. A lot of times people are surprised by that. You don't think of owls eating insects, but in the wild, they will eat things like moths. Uh, really large insects are one of their favorite things. Um, they also have a more varied diet than that. Um, mostly small mammals. Uh, so things like mice are gonna be one of their favorites. Uh, voles, uh, shrews, things like that are gonna be animals they'll go after. They might even get small snakes small frogs, uh, pretty much anything they can get, uh, they will uh, try to eat. Here at the museum, our screech owl uh, does eat those crickets. Those are more of a treat. Uh, also mealworms she really likes. Uh, the main part of her diet is actually mice. Um, so she does eat mice that are already dead. Uh, sometimes that makes people feel a little bit better about it. Um, but owls are definitely carnivores. So it's only gonna be other animals that they are ever eating. Awesome. So we have a few more questions. Uh, can they fly and do they burrow? So there is a kind of owl that is a burrowing owl. I'm guessing that's probably what you're thinking of. Um, this one is not necessarily a burrower, um, but they do nest in holes in trees. So I guess they're not making a burrow on the ground. They're not digging underground, um, but they do kind of tuck themselves, themselves away uh, into uh, the hole in a tree. Uh, and I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? Can they fly? Ours right here isn't flying. Yes, um, so our owl is pretty accustomed to just sitting on a gloved hand. Um, so she is actually capable of flight, um, but you probably noticed while Corey is holding her, she hasn't really tried to flutter much. Um, our animals here are ambassadors, so they get used to being with people uh, and they mostly uh, just like to kind of sit. She's more comfortable with Corey than she would be uh, moving around this space. Um, so you did probably notice that she hasn't really tried to fly, but she also has little straps that are basically like her version of a collar around her legs. Now those are called jesses. They're actually kind of hard to see. She's camouflaging them pretty well, um, but she does have kind of her version of a collar around her leg and then Corey is holding on to them. Um, that way, if she did potentially fall off Corey's hand, she's not gonna hurt herself. Um, so yes, they are able to fly uh, and they do have silent flight in the wild, but this specific one, you won't see fly around uh, here for the show. Oh, we have so many great questions coming in. I wish we had more time for every single one of them. I believe we have time for just maybe one more question because we do have one final animal to get to before the end of this presentation. Um, so I guess these two questions are pretty related. Actually, maybe all three can be related. So I'll ask them together. Um, so the first is, are they endangered? And then Elliot's wondering how this animal got to the museum. And also, is this a non-releasable ambassador? So they're kind of all related a little bit there. They are related. Uh, yes, she is definitely non-releasable. Um, she's always been with people, so she doesn't really understand how to take care of herself on her own out in the wild. Um, so she has a nice important job here at the museum as that ambassador animal, uh, and she's guaranteed food and uh, shelter. Um, this specific one was uh, captive born and came from another institution. Um, so like I said, she's uh, always been living with people and wouldn't really know how to care for herself on her own out in the wild. Uh, was there a third part of the question too? I'm sorry. Just are they endangered as a species? Oh, they're actually not. Uh, their numbers are actually doing pretty well. Um, so they are what is typically referred to as a species of least concern. Um, so that doesn't mean we should not care about the species. We still should care about them and try to preserve their habitat, um, but their numbers are doing pretty well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Liz. Now I, we uh, will be moving on to our final animal. So I'm going to share my screen one more time um, and so that you can get a little bit more facts on our Eastern Screech Owl. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to all of those questions, so I'm sorry about that, but we do have our final animal to get to today. So hopefully this can uh, give you a little bit more information about your animal here that we just saw, the Eastern Screech Owl. Okay, I think we're ready whenever right. everyone else is. 
Awesome. So my name is Corey. And like Liz said earlier, I am the invertebrate keeper here at the museum. So we couldn't round out our backyard animals without talking about invertebrates. So probably the one that we're the most um, used to, the one we see a lot, are bees. So this is our observation hive of uh, European honeybees or Western honeybees. Those common names are pretty interchangeable. So honeybees uh, pretty much are across the entire United States. Um, here in New England, you usually, you know, if you see one up in person, normally they're captive, um, they're captive bred. So honeybees are really interesting. One, they're really great pollinators, so we rely really heavy on them to pollinate our crops. So actually farmers will keep bees and they actually will ship them around the country to wherever um, they're having a big harvest or wherever the flowers are blooming so we can get uh, the produce that we are so used to getting. So honeybees also have a really interesting social structure. So probably as many of you may know, all of the bees you're looking at right here are all female. So they're all girl, girl bees. Boy bees are called drones. So the males, um, they pretty much are only around kind of in the spring and in the summer a little bit. After that, there's no purpose to have any drones. Uh, the drones are really just for mating. So our female bees, they do all of the work. So the female bees, they live anywhere from 122 days to 155 days um, in spring, summer, and fall. Then we have our winter bees, which are the bees you're looking at right now. So the winter bees, they actually live from about, about October, November, all the way into April and May. So they really extend their life. And that's because during the winter, they are all huddled together, trying to make sure that the colony can make it through the cold period where there's really not anything blooming and they really can't find extra food. So that's why honeybees stock up on their honey and uh, on the pollen. So they're able to eat that throughout the winter. And then when we get back to um, our summer, our spring months, these bees are the ones that will take care of the new baby bees that are coming up. So bees start as an egg and then they go into a larva, they do a pupa, and then an adult. So very similar to a butterfly. Again, we have that larva, the, or the egg, the larva, the pupa, and the adult. And then the bee that everyone knows is the queen bee. So our queen bee is tucked away in this hive. She's actually being protected by um, the worker bees. And that's a good thing. Keep her nice and warm because she is very important. She is who lays the eggs um, and that allows the colony to really thrive. So one thing that a lot of people don't know about honeybees is that they are actually not native to the United States. These were actually brought over from Europe and established themselves here. And we don't mind them because they help pollinate our crops and we really rely on them, but it does take a toll on our native bees. So animals that get really overlooked are our native bees. There's an estimate about 400 species of bees and wasps that live just here in New England. So that's a lot, a lot of native bees that we have. And those bees are perfect for pollinating our native plants. They go hand in hand together. They've evolved to be that way and they're so, so important. So our honeybees, while they do a really great job helping get us food and um, pollinating, they also sometimes can take away the resources from our native bees. So I'm gonna turn it over and see if we have any questions. We do have a lot of questions awesome. coming in, which is great. Um, so Rory is wondering how many eggs can they lay at a time and do they make a cocoon? That is such a great question. So the, I think the average for one day, the queen can lay 2000 eggs in one day. So that's a lot of eggs that can be laid. Um, the cocoon question is a really, really awesome question. So they don't make a cocoon like a butterfly. What they do is they actually go into a capped cell. So when you look at honey, I'm actually gonna ask if Liz can go up to our top frame to show us some empty, yeah, perfect. So these are some empty cells. And this is wax that the bees have built out to make these perfect little, little boxes that they um, 
can store their, their honey or any artificial food we give them, they store it in there, but it's also where the queen lays the eggs. So the queen will lay an egg at the bottom of one of these cells. And once the egg hatches, the larva comes out and it kind of looks like a little chunky worm and it's white. And then once that larva gets to a certain stage, the adult bees will put a cap over top of that cell. And then that way, and Liz may be able to show us a couple cap cells on the frame below, um, but the bees are really covering up them up. They're being pretty protective of them. So they will cover it up. And then on the inside, the larva will change. It'll pupate from a larva into the adult bee that we see. So that's a great question. Awesome. And we have uh, the same question from Prisha, age eight, and also Finn from a grade two classroom. How many bees are in there? That is a fantastic question. I have no idea. My guess would be that this hive is averaging about a thousand bees. Um, this is one of our smaller hives. So here at the museum, we do have four hives. We have three in our apiary, which is up on our roof. And then we have our observation hive, which are the ones you guys are seeing right now. So this one is smaller and I would say we have about a thousand bees right now, um, but we are still going through our fall die off. So we will still see some bees that are, um, that are getting ready to die. So the number should dwindle a little bit as, uh, as we enter into, I guess we're already kind of halfway through November, but as we uh, end November, we should really start to see a smaller group of bees. Awesome. And we have quite a few questions about queen bees. So uh, Chad, age 16, and also Angelina, age nine, have a whole bunch of questions about them. Um, do they sting? How big can they get? How old can they get? And does the hive accept another queen? Those are all fantastic questions. So uh, the queen in general. So one, she does look a little larger and her coloring is a little different from the other bees. So um, her abdomen, which is the bottom half of her body is a little bit longer. And that's how you're able to kind of spot her in a hive. We actually mark our queens and most beekeepers do. And the color on the bee indicates the year it was born. So this year, all of the queens that were, that were born are blue. So our queen used to have a blue dot on her back, but the workers kind of chipped it off. And now she has like a, a semicircle moon on her back. So she's a little harder to spot, but we do that so we can easily see her. And that will kind of lead into the next question. Um, we want to make sure that there is a queen at all times, because if the queen dies or if the workers kick her out or kill her, we need to know so we can put in a new queen. So yes, they do accept new queens. Um, and there's all sorts of different circumstances where they will. Uh, the worker bees, even though we put the title of queen and as humans, we think, well, queen, she must be in charge. She probably rules the hive. Not the case. It's really the workers who dictate where she goes, what she does, where she lays her eggs, all of those things. So the workers, if they think she's doing a bad job, they will actually um, force her to lay another queen egg that then they can raise to have a new queen and they'll kick her out. Sometimes um, a queen and the workers will choose, they'll say this hive is too small for us and they'll choose to leave and that's called swarming. So when they do that, the queen will leave behind two to four, sometimes six or seven queen cells. And the ones that develop, they actually have to um, battle it out in a sense um, to see who's going to be in charge of this hive and which one will stay. So when I say battle it out, that sounds like they get really angry and maybe they fight each other, but it's not the case. They have to spread their pheromone. So that's how bees know which queen they want to go to and which queen they're going to interact with is based on the pheromones, based on that smell. So when we're introducing a new queen, we actually leave her in a little cage um, for a couple days so the bees can get used to her pheromone and spread it throughout the entire colony. And I think the last question in there was how long do they live for? Queen bees live about three to five years. Um, depending on how they're doing. Most people will replace, beekeepers will replace their queen bee at around year three. Um, after that, the queen bees, they stop laying as many eggs. They're getting older. It's harder for them to really support a healthy hive. 
So I think I, I think I hit all the questions there. I think you did too. And it looks like we are out of time. So unfortunately we're not going to get to all of the rest of the questions. So I apologize for that, but I'd like to ask, uh, Corey and our honeybees uh, to wave goodbye. Thank you so much for all of your excellent information. I'm gonna share my screen one more time so you can get a little bit more information on our bees in case there was a question you had that we didn't get to, or if you just wanna learn a little bit more. So again, feel free to take a picture of this screen so you can learn a little bit more about the European honeybees that we have at the museum. And I'm going to switch to my last screen now because we are out of time. Again, I apologize if we didn't get to your question. We had so many come in um, and they were all really wonderful, but we are doing more of these in the future. So definitely check out mos.org slash MOS at home for a full list of our virtual offerings. And if you enjoyed this program and would like to support the museum, you can go to engage.mos.org slash welcome. Thank you all so much for coming today. I hope you enjoyed and we will see you next time.